What's up guys, Hong Nguyen, OG Fitness. Welcome to podcast number three, guys. So this one is with Steve Maxwell. So for those of you guys who don't know, uh, that's why I'm making this intro. I wanna introduce him properly, but I think a lot of you guys probably know who he is, especially the, uh, the OGs, right? Who are uh, part of the community. And Steve Maxwell is a OG of OGs. And um, to do him justice, I wanted to make this intro. Actually, I always make an intro for every single podcast, but let me explain to you guys, give you guys a brief summary of what this man is all about. Okay, so he's the he's considered a American fitness guru, uh, physical educator, and BJJ instructor, right? Uh, he was named one of the top 100 trainers in the U.S. by Men's Journal. Uh, in what year, I don't know, but uh, that's besides the point. Uh, he's a fifth degree black belt uh, under Helsin Gracie. Okay, the first person to be uh, certified to teach Gracie Jiu Jitsu in the U.S. He trained with the Gracies before the Gracies were the Gracies, before they got famous. And uh, we all know they got famous after the first UFC. He was actually one of the uh, original investors of UFC, of the first ones. Uh, one, two, I'm not sure about the two, but definitely for the one. Um, and let's see what else here. Do, 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 do. He was also the first man to teach kettlebell classes in the US. Uh, him along with uh, Pavel are credited for bringing the kettlebell right to the US um, pretty sure like they knew each other and they worked together to set up the, the RKC I think it's the uh, no KRC or kettlebell uh, something challenge uh, yes one of you guys are gonna know anyways uh, he has a master's degrees in exercise science uh, he's worked with pro athletes with government ag agencies right like the uh, DEA Secret Service FBI uh, you know, teaching, um, you know, strength and conditioning and uh, BJJ and of course uh, joint mobility. He actually does, uh, travels a lot, you know, um, because he's a digital nomad, which is really cool. So essentially he doesn't have a home um, at this point in his life, actually for a very long time now. And that's what he does. He travels the world and, uh, and trains people and uh, shares his knowledge. Okay. And also, he was a D1 wrestler, a Division One wrestler. He wrestled throughout um, high school, college, and even in the military. Okay, and a very successful um, BJJ competitor as well, which is really cool. Uh, he's 68 years old, guys, and he's in tremendous shape. Now, what else? Uh, what else can I say about Steve? Oh, I found out about this recently because I did a lot of research on him and I listened to as much as I possibly can to prepare for the podcast. And he was on the Joe Rogan podcast for, uh, well, four times. He was four times uh, on the podcast with Joe Rogan. So that's pretty, that's pretty, pretty telling uh, for, for me anyway, because Joe Rogan is, well, the man who started podcasting and super famous and very well respected in, you know, his, uh, um, well, it's Joe Rogan, man. So if Joe Rogan has somebody on his show four times, I mean, the guy's got to be interesting and know his stuff. And I think he also trained Joe Rogan as well. Um, so anyways, that's for this video. I don't want to make it too long, guys, but I just wanted to introduce to you guys uh, properly for those of you guys who don't know him or maybe who have, but maybe don't know as much of uh, as much details as I, I spewed out here. So uh, that's it, guys. Enjoy the podcast. And hopefully this won't be the last time that I get Steve uh, on a podcast. All right. Peace. now okay so the recording's in progress welcome to the channel it's an honor to have you steve you're a big thank inspiration you, thank you. i'm uh, i'm thrilled to be here uh, i'm honored you know yeah, i'm yeah. always pleasantly surprised that someone wants to listen to this guy no way <laughs> wow it was uh <laughs> it was actually a shock to me that you actually responded and said yes i was like wait a second he said yes i can't believe it you know and um uh so I, I want to introduce, uh, you know, I want to introduce you to the audience. I'm pretty sure most of the people in my in my audience knows who you are, right? But you know, just uh, just a quick thing on this, you're essentially a fitness guru. Well, okay. you have I, like, I don't like guru, you know, you know, you know. Uh, no, no, you're, you're a guru. You're a guru. In my, in my eyes, you're a guru. <laughs> spell spell guru. G U R U. Yeah. 
We're all our own guru. G U R. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, and and you've been in the industry, uh, the fitness industry, forever. Uh, I think you have like over 50, 50 years or something like that. Like, oh. Yeah, I started as a professional about, I guess, 1971, 72, and uh, started working in a part, part-time in a gym. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I was an undergrad at Westchester, I was majoring in uh, health and physical education, and uh, started working in a, uh, a gym part-time just to help make ends meet, pay off those student loans and all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but what what's even more interesting about you, right, is that well, you're you're a martial artist, and you you wrestle, right? Uh, Division one, if I'm not mistaken. Division one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Started wrestling in uh, seventh grade in Carlisle High School, and uh, went through you know junior high, intermediate high school, and then uh, wrestled four years um, at Westchester, and which was a Division one school. So, you know, we had a pretty tough schedule. We, we wrestled some of the best, uh, at, you know, in, in our area and uh, loved it. Loved wrestling. Yeah, but, yeah. I, you know, what do you do with wrestling when you graduate from university, you know? MMA. Uh, <laughs> well, in those days, MMA didn't exist, you know? Exactly, exactly. Like, no you, were, you were one of the first, uh, uh, one, of, one of the uh, first investors of the first UFC, right? That's correct. Yeah. I, but I was floundering around. I was looking for something to put all that energy into that I had formerly put into wrestling. I coached wrestling at the high school level, you know, for a couple of years. And, um, you know, but I was looking. I, I, I did some freestyle tournaments and things. But in those days, it was almost impossible to, to really wrestle with any seriousness. Mm-hmm. Uh, unless you were going for the Olympics and then you needed a sponsor. And I, I wasn't quite that elite to be an Olympian, you know. I was good, really good, but not elite. And uh, plus, I was married early, had a kid. So, you know, I had the realities of making a living. So in those days, it was a lot tougher than it is now, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, so I was just looking for something to put my energy into. And yeah, uh, you found BJJ and, and you were I like... Yeah, and you, you you hooked up with the Gracies back in the days when the Gracies weren't even the Gracies yet. You know, they weren't as uh, well known, eh? No, no one ever heard of them. You know, if you said Gracie Jiu Jitsu, they say what? You mean Japanese Jiu Jitsu? Or if you said Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, they'd say, well, y- you mean Japanese, right? Isn't Jiu Jitsu Japanese? And trying to explain Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and you know, even a final point. Gracie Jiu Jitsu was impossible. Mm-hmm. Okay. People just didn't get it. But, uh, you know, they were pretty far away from where I was in Philly. So I had to travel back and forth. In the meantime, I had opened up my own gym in 1990 after working at many different gyms all over the country. I finally opened my own. And at, at the same time, I, I um, started just like a, like a club. You know, I wasn't really qualified to teach. But, you know, I did have wrestling and I had, I knew how to organize a practice. I coached wrestling. So, you know, I knew how to coach. And, you know, it was just a bunch of guys just rolling around in the back of my gym. But mm-hmm. then that started to expand. I started bringing the Gracie's to the East Coast. And then I would fly out there and stay for a week, two weeks, and train, come back, practice the stuff, go back out again. So because I worked for myself, I was able to set up my own schedule. Hey, did, and, you, uh, did you did you learn at the same time as Chuck Chuck Norris? Because Chuck Norris hooked up with the Machado brothers, right? And and that was learning just, from them just before me, just before me, just a little bit before you. Okay, so yeah, yeah, like a year or so, you know, when all okay. that happened. And then a friend of mine, Richard, Richard Bressler, he just wrote a book worth defending. Maybe you've seen it. Uh, he 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 was with Horian from the very beginning. So when I started going to the Gracie Academy. In 90, 91, mm-hmm. they had just opened. And uh, Richard was there. And a lot of real notable people were, were going through that program at that time. John McCarthy, the big rep from the UFC, was in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe you heard of Paul Vunak, who was a uh, pretty famous martial artist. I think he was doing Jeet Kune Do. And, you know, there was, there was like a who's who of people going through the school, you know. Oleg Tuktara fought in the UFC. Uh, Sambo guy, 
he used to stop in all the time. So it was a really interesting place to be in a really interesting era, you know? Okay. Okay. And, and you're, you're, um, you're, you're a fifth degree black belt right now, right? Six degree. Six degree. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Next oh, up awesome. for me is cor- coral belt, but you know, we'll wait a little bit longer. Okay, but do you have you practiced uh, judo? Because I know I think you have a uh, uh, you, you've done some judo before, right? Well, I read in my play. I opened up um, the first uh, BJJ gym in the East Coast, mm-hmm. and um, I read space to the Philadelphia Judo Club, which is the oldest judo club in the United States. It's the oldest martial arts club in the United States. It was started by a very venerable Japanese uh, pre-World War II. So it, it, it has the distinction of being the oldest martial arts club in the USA. Mm-hmm. And um, they lost their lease at the YMCA in Philadelphia, and they were looking for a space. So I offered some space in my club. So we had the original BJJ uh, club, and then we had the Philadelphia Judo Club. And then later on, we had a couple of twin brothers that were into Muay Thai that were also uh, ex-NCAA wrestlers. They started teaching uh, stand-up striking also. So we had Judo and Jiu-Jitsu and striking. And this is way before the UFC. <laughs> this is okay, before, okay. you know, 93 is when Horian came up with the idea for the first UFC. So we're talking about like 91, 92 and around that era. Okay. 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 Yeah. 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 No, no, I understand. And it was also, new when, you know, it was really funny because people would come in and want to fight it, you know, because Horian had the Gracie challenge where mm-hmm. anyone that outside our style can beat us, will give you $10,000. And we had guys showing up at our doorstep and, you know, we were, uh, you know, I'd say, look, you want to go fight the Gracie's, not me. I'm only, I'm only a blue belt or later I'm only a purple belt, you know, uh-huh. I'm not a Gracie. I don't have any challenge out there. I'm just trying to learn this stuff, but we would set up a camera and we'd take these guys on. And so sure enough, it always was like clockwork. If they didn't know, you know, any jujitsu at all, it was pretty easy pickings to tell the guys on this trip. But, but they came in because of the, of the $10,000. They were like, okay, this is... Uh, this no, is really no, cool. they, just, they just heard how, how formidable jiu-jitsu is. And, you know, they just want to come in. And, and, and it was always um, guys in... They'd always say, well, we'd like a style comparison. Mm-hmm. Ah, say, okay. What do you do? Well, it'd be blah, blah, blah. Well, do you kick? Yeah. Do you punch? Yeah. So you want to come in and you want to fight me. You want to kick and punch me, right? Well, yeah, but a style comparison. No, no, no. <laughs> you want to you want to fight, yes? And then when they finally admit that they wanted to fight, we'd go. Okay, and, uh, okay. You know, with my wrestling takedowns, it's pretty easy to close the gap and mm-hmm. get the clinch. And I, I had pretty good takedowns back in the day. I was still a little bit more agile than I am now. So I, I could always pretty much put these guys down on the ground. And uh, it almost always ended up the same way. You know, clinch, take them down, mount slap them a few times they turn over choke it, it was almost like a script you know okay so every now and again you get a real tough dude like um wrestlers would come in that also had boxing that was in for a oh, long yeah. time yeah i got in a scrap one time with this guy about 42 minutes i finally submitted the guy but oh my god this guy really was coming at me it was yeah. a long 42 minutes the guy he was so big and powerful, I just couldn't do anything to him. But here's the power of jujitsu: he couldn't do anything to me. Mm. A couple yeah. bruises, a couple bumps, but nothing serious, you know. And I eventually choked him to sleep. So, you know. Okay. In in reality, if that was a real fight, he mm-hmm. would have died. I would have lived. He would have what? He would have died, and I would have lived. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Of course, because that's. There's, there's no, you know, like if it was a life and death thing, then you would have had to, you know, essentially finish them off, right? And that choke in itself, that's that's what a choke represents, essentially. And the only thing we agreed to do was not uh, poke each other eye and bite. Yeah, because that's like permanent damage, right? So I yeah, mean, I mean, at I least you have to have that gentleman's agreement. Get mm-hmm. my ear, or not, my nose bit off or something, you know. But everything else went punching the balls, grabbing here, you know. 
bending fingers. He tried to bend my fingers when I got a choke on, but you know, I, I knew how to hide my fingers. You know, I, I bent his thumb really bad at one point. <laughs> it was a fight, dude. It was a fight, man. But yeah, that's like, you know, like I talk about that on my channel because um, there's a lot of discussion on my channel about um, like, what's the best combo, you know, for self-defense, you know? And I always say like, if you want to pick up something really fast, you know, wrestling, if you have access to wrestling and, and, and boxing and they're, you know, like you, you could, Great I think, combination, man. yeah, you could, you could get good at those, I believe faster than you can get good at, uh, for example, judo or uh, even BJJ, right? BJJ, I might be wrong there. You could get pretty good at that too. But I mean, if it's just for self-defense, you know? Well, if you had no more than, let's say, blue belt level skills in jujitsu, Mm -hmm. And you apply that to like, uh, you know, self-defense and fighting, you'd be pretty formidable. You'd be very formidable. If you had some judo and wrestling along with some boxing skills and you just picked up even, even just a blue belt level skill, you, you would be pretty safe. Mm -hmm. for the, most. the higher levels of jujitsu were more geared to fighting other jujitsu guys. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense because yeah. how much jujitsu do you really need for self defense? You know, yeah, against your your common thug, you right? Yeah, it always comes down to like the stuff you learn in your first year, pretty much. You know, mm -hmm. but here's the thing: in realistic fighting, the closest thing to a real fight is like when white belts come into the club because they thrash and they do unexpected stuff. They, you know, they don't react to any setups. You know, they they move in very unexpected manner. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of like real fighting. What we do in class with each other when sparring is pretty unrealistic. Only another jujitsu guy would react that way. And, you know, when it comes to self-defense, no one, no one's going to react that way. That's why it's important just to practice the basic self-defense. Yeah, because I, I remember, like, when I, when I first started jujitsu, after, um, after about three to six months, we'd have like a, a beginner walk in and that's when I realized, wow, like I could really manhandle this guy, even if he yeah. was bigger and stronger than me, because he just didn't know anything at all. And then of course he would fight for his life. Some of these guys were big and strong, but yeah. it didn't matter because they didn't know anything. So yeah, well, I think you would get him. It might take a while to cook a really big, strong guy, but you eventually get him. In the meantime, he can't do much to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, exactly, exactly. You know, like if a big, strong, athletic guy, it's going to take a little bit of time to, you know, to, to wear him out and to, to choke him or tap him. But then once that guy picks it up, after about three months, if he, if he sticks to it <laughs> after three months, like I had a guy like that. I couldn't, after three months, he was hor like, it, forget about it. He, he just, you know. I've had the same experience. Big, heavy, strong, naturally athletic guys, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, they pick it up pretty quick and you know, it's really funny, too, because, you know, we we would have young men, sometimes teenagers mm -hmm. and sometimes smaller guys. And, and we'd always say, hey, you know, to the other guys, be really nice to him because he's not going to be little forever, man. <laughs> 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 that kid in like five, ten years, look out, man. Be nice to him now because he might not be so nice to you later. You know? <laughs> yeah, I saw yeah, a lot exactly. of kids start 14, 15 in adult classes mm -hmm. and you know, the the adult men sometimes just smash them. Big mistake. By the time that kid was 17, 18, 19, he would definitely get his come up and you know. <laughs> you know, that's that that's you know, that's uh that's a fun it's funny that you should say that because last night I was uh, I was at judo practice and you know there's like the, these uh these like there's these two brothers, right? One of them's 12, the other one's 14. And I think they're both one of them's green, the other one's blue belt. But these guys have skills, though. They're technically sound. Problem is, they're really small. The bigger brother yeah. beats up on his younger brother, but he only has about two years left before his brother uh, gets to his size. And then after that, it's, it's game over. I mean, like, even Steven, man. Exactly. <laughs> but the 14-year-old, like, I go nice with that guy because I know that when, when he hits um, puberty and he starts putting on some muscle mass, so he's 14 now, let's say he kick, it kicks in around, you know, 16, and he's 16, 17, and he feels yeah. out, he's gonna, he could, he, he's gonna whoop my ass. He can light you up, man. Yeah, so, yeah, he, he'll light me up, because he's technically better than me, and he has He, he will remember, he will remember, yeah, he'll, he'll always have 
kindness and mercy in his heart for you as he starts to go up the ladder, you know? Yeah. You know, and I'm not, I'm not getting any younger. I'm 42. So if I'm, if I'm a, if I'm a jerk to him now, <laughs> it's going to be better, uh, karma. Karma is, you know, is a bitch, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, man. Hey, so. Yeah. So I always tell my guys, be nice to those young upcoming kids, man. Mm-hmm. You know, hold back a little bit, play bottom. Don't smash the little guys. Because they might, they're, you know, these kids aren't going to be little forever. And yeah, it's yeah. just, and you know, it's the same, you know, wrestling with females or smaller, weaker people. You always give them the advantageous positions, put yourself in the worst position. If you sweep them or come up, you, you know, you let them sweep your back. You know, you help them escape. You try to help each other develop a little bit of the bag, you know, instead of just always making it like this big competitive tournament, you know. Mm-hmm. That's the, quick way to get burnt out and getting hurt people that are hyper competitive big mistake big mistake yeah no no i like um what i've um what i try to do now is that i try to train mostly with people who are lighter than me who are a little bit lower level so that i could just focus on technique and certain yes. and focus on certain aspects of my game yeah, uh, I'm not trying to smash them at all. I'm just, yeah, I'm, no, just, just I'm just working, working on my thing. If I get them, I get them. But if they get me, I let them get me. You know, I'm not going to muscle out of, uh, you know, their throws or whatever. And then from there, once in a while, I'll go with um, guys who are um, who are at my level, my weight. And then once in a blue moon, I'll go with the like the really advanced guys because those guys essentially that's where I, I'd go if I just want to test out a skill that I've been working on you know, test myself a little bit, a little bit once in a while, because I fit, I find it, there's no sense in me to go with these guys all the time because all I do is get smashed. And you get hurt and you don't really learn that well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Unless, unless they play down a, a notch, you know, if mm-hmm. they'll play down, a notch. but you're right. Going with people that are a little bit smaller, a little bit weaker, a little bit less skilled. It's like resisted uh, drill. You're drilling, you know, you can get the technique, and you just perfect your timing, your precision, your entries, you know, your your counter throw should they happen to stop your 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 main attack. And you get really good that way. And then you go against your peers, you know, once or twice a week. And then, like you say, once in a while, you go against the big guns, you know? Yeah, go yeah. Against- once in a blue moon, but not not often, because I realize yeah. now that I used to yeah. have this. Yeah, exactly. And you know, like about uh, about two weeks ago, I went with this guy. Uh, he was an ex national team member, judo, and he threw me. And I did like a five hundred eighty degree spin in the air, and then I landed right on my neck. You know, like yeah. this type of fashion, like this. Oh, I landed you're lucky hard. You really, man. Hmm? You're lucky you weren't really really badly injured. I was scared. That was the first time I was actually worried about my neck because i've I've fallen hard before uh, but i know how to fall and you know i'm I'm pretty uh well conditioned for um so so you know i could take falls and get up and keep going but that was the first time like my neck cracked and i felt a jolt of electricity go down my spine my cervical spine and my thoracic spine i was scared i was really scared that he caught a stinger a stinger eh? yeah you got the nerve damn uh, injured you know like bruised maybe probably took a couple of days for it to go away oh it's still yeah yeah it did absolutely and my neck was still stiff for the first week and then the second week now it's starting to get better i went to see my uh, osteo she worked on my neck then i went to see my sports doctor um and uh she sent me to go get an x-ray to make sure that there's no fractures or anything wrong like she doubted but she was pretty sure there wasn't but she wanted to be a hundred percent sure because she knows yeah, that no, I- you don't want to mess with the neck was there any tingling or numbness in the hands or nerve radiating nerve pain? Luckily, no. Luckily, no. Yeah, that that's good. So, yeah, and it then, was you, you got stunned, but at least you know you didn't get terrible damage. But but get this: after that, I talked to my um, uh, I talked to another uh, another one of my teammates, and he used to be uh, an um, he, he's ex national also, and he told me that guy is actually a douche because even when he was on the national team, the guy who threw me, people didn't want to go with him because he had a bad reputation of hurting people. 
when he would throw them because he would throw some really unorthodox throws out of the blue. He would do like some really awkward stuff and he would go full throttle, no control. You know, so he would bust guys, uh, you know, shoulders, knees, elbows, whatever, you know. And and then from there, from when he told me that, I'm like, okay, noted. You know, I'm not mad at the guy, but uh, that's the last time I'm going with that dude. You know, yeah. usually you go with a black belt, they have control. You know, like I, I've went with a lot of like high level guys, right, on the national team and, and all that. And they throw me, they throw me hard, but it's clean. It's, it's pretty clean. technically sound. There's no entanglement. There's no twisting. There's no, you know, and or, so, or some of those big guys that fall on you when they throw. Oh, oh God. <laughs> hey, really so, bad news. Yeah, really yeah, bad. no, it's horrible. When they, when they use you as a crash pad, oh, <laughs> I've had that my ribs, you know. Oh, yeah, but, but that's. Uh, did you watch the judo in the Olympics? Uh, yeah, yeah, I watched a couple of the uh, uh like just a couple of highlights. To be honest, there, there was one match where the guy landed right on his neck, kind of the mm. point of his shoulder side of the neck. I, I was he was trying to prevent it, pawn, but he used his own head and neck to prevent it. Oh, I just. Uh, I shuddered when I saw it. it. It just looked so bad. I'm sure that guy is still sore, you know, if he, if, if not outright injured. Sometimes mm-hmm. the adrenaline will keep you going and you won't feel it. And then for like the next month, man, you can't even turn your head, you know? Oh, yeah. You got to be careful about that. And, um, you know, now like I started, um, you know, one thing that really inspired me was uh, watching some, some more recent uh, interviews that you did. And there was one you, you, you did with, I forgot his name. It's, I think his name is Drew, Drew, Drew Bay. Drew Beck. Yeah, Drew Beck. He's a uh, strength training specialist. Mm-hmm. Very, very intelligent guy. Yeah, and you guys were talking about uh, super slow. And then yeah. talking about uh, isometrics. Yeah. And then I was listening to that. And then I listened to the whole thing. I think I must have listened to uh, between 15 and 20 hours of of uh of your videos on youtube wow. before you know before we got on this call here before we, we we did this podcast so i have a lot of information right now rolling in my head and then what i come to realize is that wait a second super slow and isometric if that's all i need to um get really strong for my sport and save my joints that's what i'm gonna do and i did a workout like just before uh, we we hopped on, damn, that was hard. That was, that was hard. so hard. That was so yeah. hard. Unbelievable. The, um, I've changed my views a little bit in the past few years. You know, like um, let me start by saying that almost any system that's progressive and hard will give you results. You know, powerlifting works. Olympic lifting works, kettlebells work, you know, CrossFit works, uh, you know, bodybuilding works, gymnastics training type works, you know. You'll see people getting big, strong, muscular on almost anything, body weight only, you know, mm-hmm. isometric. But if, to, if you were to do any number of programs and really train hard and progressively over a number of years, you would reach a certain point genetically, right? You would meet your genetic potential. And how long that takes is it's somewhat individual, but most people can reach their genetic potential between three to five years. You know, but you, you, make you mean in terms, of, in terms of strength or in terms of muscle? Yeah. Muscle uh, okay. All of it. Your hypertrophy, strength, you know. Mm-hmm. You, you don't reach it three to five years. Some people faster, some people a little longer, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it depends. If you're doing other strenuous activities, which would hold you down, obviously, if you're a marathon runner or, you know, you're riding uh, Tour de France type bike races, it's going to take you a lot longer to put on muscle than, let's say, a guy that does nothing but strength training. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in our game, you know, with uh, grappling, it is a form of resistance training. We're always resisting our muscles against someone else. So it's very easy to get overtrained if you're adding too much volume and multiple sets and, you know, some guys try to train like bodybuilder 
while doing judo. And it's very hard. It's very easy to get overtrained. But the point I'm trying to make is that any number, any number of systems will bring you to the same point. So if that's true, why not pick the, the system that takes the least amount of time? Why not pick the system that is safer, that is proven safety record? And why not pick the system that um, is a lot less stressful on your joints? That's my point. You're going to get you're going to get good results on any number of programs, but for me, I want the least amount of time. I want the one that's safest and most sustainable. Mm -hmm. okay. And I'm going to pick that over something else. So I'm not saying this doesn't work and that doesn't work, but you know we only have so much time in the day. And in a sport like grappling or jujitsu or judo or whatever, uh, the the majority of your time and energy needs to be in the mat. You need to perfect your skills and you need to do it a lot. So you can't afford to do these big marathon strength training sessions or train like an Olympic weightlifter or whatever, you know? The other point I want to make, there's this myth out there that training fast and explosive will make you fast and explosive on the mat. It's not true. The way you get fast and explosive on the mat is by doing your techniques fast and explosive, you know? You, you do your fit-in throws. You do actual throws, you know? Mm -hmm. And you can save your partner a lot of wear and tear by just throwing them on a crash pad, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Try, you know, you, you know um, we used to do like 100 throw workouts. You just pick your primary throw and do 100, uh, 50 of those, and then your secondary throw and do 50 of those. That's a hell of a workout, man. Really tiring. And maybe you alternate with your partner like every five to 10 throws, you know? I'll do mm -hmm. five, you do five. I do five, you do five. Then we switch the throw. Man, by the time you're done with that, you get a tremendous amount of practice and, and, and you know, you, you really fine tune it. At the same time, you know, your cardiorespiratory system and, and your muscles do get a bit of a work, even though it's technique based. That's the way you get good at your sport. Not doing power cleans or kettlebell snatches or box jumps or all that stuff. Do those things work? Yeah, more or less, but with a lot of wear and tear on your joints. They really tear you down over time. That's what I found. You know, the kettlebells in particular, uh, the, the high repetition type cleans and swings and snatches really wreck your elbows and your shoulders. And, you know, there's a lot of shearing force in your spine. That's why I switched over to isometrics and uh, slow, high tension body weight training. Yeah, yeah. And part, and part of that was convenience too. Because I didn't have a lot of equipment. And I, I don't like to be equipment dependent. I like stuff I can do right on the side of the mat after training, you know? Mm -hmm. All you need is a pull-up bar or a good rope to climb or something, you know? You don't need a lot of equipment. If, if, if you were to, like, uh, if you were able to go back in time, right, with what you know now, would you, like, completely disregard, uh, not, not completely disregard, but would you stick to isometrics and super slow? And then just focus on skill. I would have. That's what you, uh, that's what you that's would recommend for. Hmm? That's where I was when I first started Jiu Jitsu. Yeah, and yeah. You did that for wrestling. I started, you veering, that. Off. I started veering off. I got, you know, I, I fell for the, uh, the slick marketing and advertising of the kettlebell movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very slick, you know. But I learned later on that there was a lot of half, half truths and some outright falsehoods being told you know by by the marketing people behind that whole kettlebell thing mm -hmm. a lot of fake stuff you know a lot of things that were exaggerated or just pure lies really so it took me a while to figure it out but also i was starting to feel it on my own joints and mm -hmm. i'm thinking wow this doesn't feel right this doesn't seem right my ex-wife dc maxwell she was the third american woman in the U.S. to get a black belt in BJJ. She's one of the original Dirty Dozen women for the black belt. And she was also on the ground floor of the kettlebell movement with me. And she was on, uh, remember that book published that Soline wrote uh, from Russia with Tough Love? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, she's on the cover of that book with um, John Duquesne's wife, Andrea Duquesne, two beautiful women and uh, great figures and pretty faces and of course that sells 
But she was telling me even back then, you know, I just think some of this kettlebell stuff is really dangerous and horrible. Mm-hmm. And I said, oh, she says, wouldn't it be a kick in the pants of 10, year, 10 years down the road? We say, wow, we really made a big mistake that this stuff isn't so good for your joints after all. And she was right. She actually had to have a hip replacement surgery. Yeah. Hip replacement surgery. You know, it's- now, what, it wasn't all just kettlebell, but she, they place a lot of wear and tear on your joints, unnecessarily so. The idea of moving fast and explosive and, you know, all this, you, there, you do get a lot of wear and tear on your joints. So, you know, let that be, you know, uh, a cautionary tale. You know, some people love kettlebells. They seem to be thrive on it fine. But, you know, just look for telltale signs. Morning stiffness, back stiffness, waking up with aches and pains, elbows and shoulders starting to hurt, you know. You can only do so much stretching and other therapies to mitigate that see in my way of thinking your strength training should prevent injuries not cause your strength training should make your joints feel good it should be like medicine i look at strength training as medicine and anti-aging but if i'm waking up with aches and pains and stiffness and my elbows and shoulders start to hurt my knees well there's something wrong with that system it should make you feel better not worse and that's what kettlebells are doing for a lot of people. And I was an avid, you know, uh, uh, practitioner. I mean, I was really, you know, pushing people with this kettlebell stuff. But, you know, I learned the hard way. Luckily, I escaped without too much damage. I pretty much damaged my right shoulder, but I'm okay. But a lot of the guys, uh, early practitioners, have had all sorts of joint replacement surgeries and, you know, Pablo himself has had his elbows operated on a couple of times. You know, he, he can't do he can't do pull ups or do, do stuff anymore. Uh, the CEO of Strong First, Brett Jones, has nine knee surgeries. What the hell kind of system, you know, creates damage that you have to have surgery? No thanks. I'm into it for the long. I'm looking. I'm into the long game. You know, I I, I want to still be able to get on the mat when I'm 80. Or even ninety, like Master Elio Gracie, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that's what uh, that that's what I want to do too. Because I'm 42 now, but I'm starting to feel it. So I'm 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 very concerned now with longevity in my joints. And I'm like, okay, well, if I want to go wor- win a world title, I have to keep my body intact, keep my joints that's intact. Right. Now, how am that's I going right. to do that? I got to train smarter. I got to train smarter. So I got to figure out a way to train. And to recover properly, and then because I, I listened to so much of your uh, interviews uh, in the past couple of days, like things started clicking in in my mind. I'm like, wait a second. I think I think Steve knows what he's talking about. Like he really knows, and I should really pay attention at this point where I am. You know, when I was, um, and I think we might have talked about this off camera right before we uh, we started recording, but. Uh, I discovered you about 10 years ago. And back then, like, I was like, yeah, got some, Steve's got some really interesting ideas, you know, really cool guy and all. But I didn't take it all that to heart. I didn't take it all that seriously and to heart, right? But now, fast forward 10 years later, I'm 42 now. And now, now I'm listening to your stuff again. And I'm like, wait a second, you know, now it's starting to make sense. Now it's starting to stick. Well, you, you know, you get you, people will get the message when it's time, you know. But hopefully and, not too late. You know what I mean? Because not too late. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But you know, you got to realize people need to realize that a lot of the things they're doing are causing micro trauma, subacute injuries. Uh, sometimes you get an injury on the playing field, or on the track and field, or the tennis court, or the basketball court, on the jujitsu mat. You get this injury. And you'll, you, you'll make the assumption that what you were doing at that moment is what caused the injury. But it's not true. Not all the time. A lot of times that injury had been brewing for weeks or even months, maybe years. The joint integrity being slowly eroded. All this micro trauma, subacute injuries going on in the joint from just dumb exercises, stupid weight training, you know. And Little by little, the joint is deteriorating, but you don't feel it. You know, it's like smoking cigarettes. 
I knew, I knew guys that smoked for decades and they seemed fine. And then one day they start coughing up blood and they go and they find out they have emphysema or, you know, lung cancer or something horrible. But they seem fine because cigarette was a small insult to the body. The body's amazing at, you know, at, at, at overcoming these things. But, you know, you, you'll, you'll, you'll hurt your knee in the mat or you pop your elbow or your neck or your shoulder, your back will go out. And that might have been brewing for a really long time from, you know, doing something very questionable. Mm. So for the most part, I'm into control on all my exercises. Slow, controlled movement. And moving slow won't make you slow. As a matter of fact, if you're going to get explosive, isometrics will make you very explosive. That's one reason why the, the late, great Bruce Lee was a very a big advocate of isometric training. It makes your muscles like coiled springs. Hmm. Interesting enough, the U.S. Um, Olympic judo team uh, up in Massachusetts there under Pedro, um, not Pedro, so, um, Jimmy, Jimmy Pedro. Pedro, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the strength and conditioning coach came and did a, a little session with me with isometrics. And he said that he, he, he was training all the, uh, the guys in the judo team with isometrics. He felt that it was just the best way to go for preventing injuries. And for you can still work out even if you are injured with isometrics. Yeah, that's, that's, you, don't need, that's you don't need a lot of equipment. Yeah, even if you blew your knee out, you can still work your quadriceps and your hamstrings isometrically without irritating your knee. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and you're saying that like isometrics could actually make you more explosive make you more explosive you know there's this idea that if you move fast you're selectively recruiting fast twitch muscle fiber mm-hmm. the research doesn't support that at all now fast training works you will get stronger mm-hmm. you get more explosive but not because you're moving fast but just because you're getting strong any even going really slow will make you faster and more explosive at no, uh, uh, non uh, at other non-related activities yeah, you don't have to move, you don't have to do jump squats with a barbell on your back to get better at jumping. You can do real slow or even isometric squats, and then you got to practice jumping. <laughs> if you want to dunk a basketball, you got to go out there and you got to do layups and you got to practice dunking, you know, because it's a skill. Mm-hmm. But you know, doing box jumps and you know, uh, power cleans and jump squats with a barbell on your back, you're just fucking your joints up for no good reason. So what do you think of, uh, you know, in judo, how sometimes when they want to practice their throws, they call it uh, power, power uchikomis. So what it is, is that, for example, if I want to throw somebody with a uh, ipon seonage, right? So that's a, a essentially yeah. arm throw. So yeah. what, what, it, what, it, what, what we do in that instance is that I have my uke, the guy that I'm going to throw, and then there's somebody behind them holding them down. So essentially I can't lift them, you know, like I'm going to try, I'm going to lift them, but then he's going to be held there. Like I'm going to hold them in the air while the, and try and throw them while the other guy in the back of them is holding them back. And I'm thinking about that now. That's like one way that we in judo, they tend to train for, for explosiveness and, and power and strength. But I'm, I'm thinking about it. And it's like, well, that, that, start, that starts to look a lot like isometric but very specific to judo. Do you think, yeah. would you consider that safe or am I better, would it be better to just focus on isometrics? Suddenly exploding into a, like a heavy weight like that is never mm-hmm. a good idea. Puts a lot of trauma. The other problem with that is you're developing a different skill set. You're never going to throw a guy your weight. Judo is a weight class sport. Mm-hmm. You're fighting guys your own weight. You don't need to lift heavier weights. What you need mm-hmm. to do is be uh, more skilled at working with your partners and your opponents. And you can only do that through repetition. But trying to get strong that way, it, it's just a backward way of doing it. Trying to take uh, trying to um, emulate sports skills with strength training is always a step in the wrong direction. There, uh, it, ca- uh, it causes motor learning confusion. In motor learning, right? skill transfer it's either negative positive or indifferent and that drill would either be indifferent with 
no real transfer to your, your regular throw, or in some ways it might even cause negative transfer. And what's confusing, you have some people that are called discriminators. They just have this nervous system that no matter what they do, no matter how God awful, they, they seem to just thrive. And they tend to be the champions. So you see a champion athlete doing something like that and getting away with it because he's a discriminator. But the average guy with average genetics, it just works against you. And that's, that's been known for over 100 years in motor learning studies. Better just to practice with your partner and throw them full speed. You know, maybe start out a little slow and just build up till you just throw them as hard as you can. That's where those crash pads really come in handy. So you don't have to just repetitively just take those falls over and over again. Yeah, yeah. Like at our club, we have we have a whole bunch of crash mats and we use them very, very often. Uh, you know, of course, when we're we're doing uh, randori, uh, you know, like uh, free practice, then of course we have sure, to get sure. rid of them so that we could practice and all because there's a whole bunch of people on the mats. But when we're just throwing, when we're just practicing our throws, we we pull out the crash mats, which I think is a you know it's, it's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, why take all those falls if you don't have to? Yeah, exactly. Because you know, like, there's only so much your body could take, right? Like, uh, I was talking to my coach the other day, and I was, you know, I had this spot that, hey, you know, if I wanted to get better at judo, shouldn't I do? Shouldn't I be doing judo every single day? He's like, nope, not unless you're a kid. And he's like, you, you, there's only, there's a limit to how much your body could take. And he said, you're 42, like, like, you know, like three times a week, judo, plenty, is- plenty. three days a week. Now that doesn't mean you can't go in and, you know, um, just do light drill and fit in throws without the actual throw, you know, practice your favorite, uh, setups, work on your timing a little bit with a cooperative partner, you know? And you can do that every day, but you can't, you can't go hard every day. No way, man. You just get yeah. burnt out. You know, that's why in most junior schools, anybody over 50 is very rare to find someone over 50. Mm-hmm. And when they are, they're pretty crippled up. <laughs> we had this one guy that used to train, we called him judo Mark in exercise. Um, uh, Mark Companeus. He was a very, very good judo player. I think he placed in judo nationals a couple of times, but this poor guy, his favorite throw was drop sand Augie, but his knees were a mess. His feet and ankles. He, he had to. He used to use duct tape instead of like regular athletic tape, and he would use almost like a half a wall of duct tape for each practice. Oh. I mean, yeah. I mean, he just had to just tape his ankles and his feet and knees, and he put a knee pad on and just duct tape the heck out of his joints because they were almost completely damaged and ruined from the way he would go about doing his throw very explosive guy but it really worked against him you know yeah and he's yeah, a guy that was doing explosive box jumps and you know that low jump where you jump repeatedly across the mat you, you, you just really screw your knees up doing that kind of stuff you know it's just too much wear and tear mm-hmm. your body really does have like a, a you know a, like a, a limit to how much wear and tear it can do yeah yeah and, and like uh in terms of your joints, do you think that it's possible to regenerate them in a sense? Like if you do no, it enough, once it's it gone, it's gone, man. Yeah. Once it's gone, eh? It's gone, man. Yeah. Oh, man. You're, you're not, you're not going to come back from osteoarthritis, or whatever. Sometimes you can do some surgery and scrape it out or whatever. But the surgery, uh, it, it has its own risk, you know, secondary infections. And then the rehab is real bare on a lot of that stuff, you know? I've known people, they were told by the orthopedic guy that it's like a walk in the park. And six months later, they're still totally messed up from those type of surgery. So you never know how you're going to react. Better to avoid it if you could possibly do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, if your quality of life is so bad and you're in so much pain, okay, go for the surgery maybe. But if it's just mild discomfort, there's other ways you can mitigate that, you know? There's natural uh, herbal enzymes and things. I'm using turmeric, you know, and curcumin and some of these natural herbs that kind of keep the inflammatory state down. Okay, okay, yeah. Hey, so knowing that, like, what's your opinion on back squats and Jefferson curls? Because in both cases, you're loading the spine. 
And There's I mean, no reason to do either one of those. Hmm? You know, the only people that should be doing uh, barbell back squats are power lifters, maybe Olympic lifters as a as an assistance lift. Um, there's no reason to do it. It really isn't. There's other ways you can load your legs up. Uh, you don't even need really, really heavy weight to meet your maximum strength. I know that sounds crazy, but it's not necessarily about the weight. It's about the effort. And a clever guy can use a relatively lighter weight, even just body weight, mm -hmm. and make the exercise so muscularly hard. And that doesn't hurt the joints at all. But man, do your muscles get one heck of a workout. And you're going to express whatever genetic capability you have for muscular strength, even with lighter weight. It's not, it's not the heavy weight. Only people that should really be concerned with heavy weights are either crossfitters or some type of competitive weightlifting. For normal people, you don't need to go heavy weight. I, can I took a guy. Uh, I, I did a seminar at the Cincinnati Reds uh, baseball training camp in uh, Arizona. And uh, I went there and I was working with the, the trainers, the cadre that worked with the baseball players. And there's a couple of real big, strong dudes in there. And this one guy claimed to do squats for sets and reps with over 500 pounds. That's by, that's a pretty strong dude, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I showed him how to make body weight squats really hard. Because, you know, most people could knock out a lot of body weight squats pretty effortlessly. I showed him a, a, how to change the leverage and stay out of the top portion. Mm -hmm. It's called short lever system. The dude died in five reps with his body weight. <laughs> and he was a real believer because he saw how effective it was. Mm. His muscles were working extremely hard, even though he's only using his body weight. And if you use leverage against yourself, you know, most people are trying to use leverage, you know, to lift more weight. You know, and we use leverage in our sport, you know, to get an advantage over our opponent. We're always looking for the best leverage. But in body weight exercises or exercises with lighter weight, if you can make leverage part of the resistance so that you're staying out of the easier range of motion and you're, you're working within those weaker ranges, and you can take a relatively light weight or your body weight and just make it as hard as humanly possible. You can do that with push-ups, body weight squats, pull-ups, chin-ups. You don't have to go to one-legged pistol squats or anything like that. Even with just two-legged squats, I could show you a way that you would just drop onto the floor after four or five reps. And the time under load would be pretty significant. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And what you about... get all the hypertrophy. You get everything. All, so, like, because you know. I'm thinking, like, the, bet, the way I would do it now is to combine isometrics and super slow. Because when you do super slow, you get the eccentric portion of the exercise as well, right? You get both. No, it's yeah. interesting. When you're training at fairly fast speeds, your eccentric strength is about 40% greater than your, your, your uh, concentric strength. In other words, your ability to lower is much greater than your ability to lift. About 40%. But when you slow the concentric down, let's say to 10-10, all of a sudden, your negative and positive strength almost become evil. This has been shown in the laboratory, you know, experimental. So when you go slow, you no longer have that big advantage of, of getting a big rest um, when, you, when you're doing the negative. So by the time you hit your third or fourth rep, you're doing all you can do just to lower down with control. Mm -hmm. At faster rates, that doesn't happen. If I lift a barbell in like one second, two seconds, I can, you know, I, I have tremendous strength in lowering. Mm -hmm. But if I take a good long 10 seconds to lift that barbell into position, and then I do a slow turnaround and start lowering it back down, all of a sudden I'm being taxed eccentrically as well. So. Okay. But what if you, what if you just do focus on isometrics? So you're just, you're just there, but so, cause the isometrics are not moving. Would you still get the benefit of the um, of the so-called you know positive and eccentric like uh, portion of? Well, you don't need it because you're still recruiting all the uh, muscle fiber. Mm, okay, yeah, that makes sense. That makes and sense. you see, with the isometrics, you're not getting mechanical damage. 
when you're doing positive and negative work, you know, looking up and down, you're getting mechanical damage, right? That, that stimulates your body to grow and get stronger. Mm-hmm. With isometrics, you're getting metabolic damage. The stimulus is metabolic. And I, I'm with you, though. I think it's good to combine metabolic with mechanical. So, okay, but what, what do you mean by metabolic damage? Because I, I, I think I understand me- mechanical uh, damage, right? It's, your, it's micro tears in your, in your, in your uh, muscle fibers, which have to rebuild afterwards to get... Well, ma- imagine this. Uh, imagine getting in a push-up position. And then you lower down halfway and just hold it, right? You're just holding halfway, really hard. Okay, well, uh, say that again. Like, imagine if I'm doing a. You, you get in a push-up position at the top, right? Mm-hmm. Arms locked, body yeah. straight, mm-hmm. abs contracted. Excuse me. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> and you lower down halfway, so your arms are bent about ninety degrees. So your mm-hmm. chest is about that far off the floor. Yep. And you hold it. And you hold it. There's no mechanical work taking place. Mm-hmm. But eventually, your muscles get so exhausted, you drop. And you don't have an ounce of strength left in your chest, arms, and shoulders. What happens? There's no mechanical damage. Well, maybe a little mechanical damage. Mm-hmm. It's metabolic. Metabolically, your muscles were firing to the point where they can no longer hold the load, and then they fail on you. You sink down and sink down to the floor. Yeah, you Everyone use up all the energy. <laughs> yeah, that's metabolic damage. That's okay, gotcha, gotcha. It's like uh, the wall sit. Have you ever done those wall sits back against the wall and you squat down like a like a, like you're sitting in an invisible chair? Yeah, yeah, in? I know what you mean. Well, I've done, I've done, I haven't, I, I know what those are, uh, but I've done because I, I I did kung fu as a kid as a yeah, I did horse, kung fu, horse stance. Yeah, they oh, just make God. you stay there and it's like agonizing. That's yeah. metabolic work. Uh huh. No, no mechanical work. But that's really good for people that have joint ailments or arthritis or whatever. You're not doing me- me- mechanical damage. You, you know, you're, the damage is from uh, metabolic work. The muscles are recruiting more and more from slow twitch, and then you go to the fast twitch. At the end, you can't hold yourself up, and boom, your muscles just give out. And you Meta- said that you you recover. Fa- do you recover faster from those types? I, of I think you recover a little bit faster without the mechanical damage. And it's certainly good for us because our muscles are undergoing a lot of mechanical damage every time we step on the mat, gripping, grabbing, especially fingers and grip and wrist and forearms and you know, you know, pretty. Yeah, yeah, pretty, yeah. Exactly. It's exhausting, but you'll find isometrics will you still have amazing power and strength, mm-hmm. and. Uh, you, you'll find that you'll, you'll still be maybe even more explosive than you've ever been before. Mm. But you, you were saying, I remember in one of your, um, uh, one of the interviews uh, that I listened to that technically speaking, if I'm on the mats, you know, um, four or five times or more per week, I should be training. Maybe I should only be having one strength session a week. One strength session a week. Yeah. And I'm uh, starting to realize that that was like, uh, I remember the first time I heard that uh, I, I, I was really into wrestling. And after I graduated, I still continued to wrestle a little freestyle, like open tournament. Mm-hmm. And I went to the, uh, the uh, Montreal um, international uh, tournament in freestyle wrestling mm-hmm. and went up and uh, I met in the semifinals, a, uh, a Russian guy, Victor Silverman. He was a silver medalist in the Olympics, and uh, I believe he won the European uh, wrestling freestyle wrestling. I think he placed in the world uh, in, in the world championship. Very good wrestler, mm-hmm. way out of my league, man. And he pretty much kicked my butt. <laughs> and uh, later, I was talking to him and his trainer uh, in the locker room, and he didn't speak English, but his trainer did. And uh, I didn't realize at the time that he was trying to defect to Canada. <laughs> This is in the early 80s. Yeah, maybe not even. It might have been in the late 70s. Yeah, I think maybe late 70s. And uh, anyway, I was asking about his supplementary training through his interpreter, and mm-hmm. he told me that he only lifted weights once a week. And I asked this question three times. Once a week? You know, I thought you had to lift three days a week. You know, I couldn't even wrap my mind around even twice a week. 
And he kept insisting he lifted weights one time a week. The rest of the time he spent wrestling. And I thought, wow. And then I talked to some other uh, guys in the old Soviet team. And, um, yeah, especially during season, one time a week. It was enough. You burn out. Too much strength training when you're doing a, a really tough sport like judo or Russian sambo mm-hmm. or star wrestling or, you know, a- any high-intensity martial art, MMA, Muay Thai, mm-hmm. jiu-jitsu. You're going to burn out if you try to train more. Now, the problem is there's a lot of steroid abuse in jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't really test for it very effectively. A lot of guys are abusing the steroids. And, you know, they're usually the champions. They can get away with training way more than an average guy. And they're already, remember we talked about the bell curve for height? Well, mm-hmm. they're in that far right bell curve for, you know, strength, endurance, coordination, you know, all those athletic talents that make them champions. Mm-hmm. They're way out there in the 1% mark. And if they're taking steroids on top of their superior genetics, they're like freaking Superman compared to like, you know, guys like me and you, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I can't, I can't speak for you, but a guy like me anyway. <laughs> and mm-hmm. unfortunately, these kids try to emulate their training programs. And it's a big step. It's a step in the wrong direction, man. You know? Mm-hmm. It's a step in the wrong direction. Unless you know you're a genetic phenomenon, and you know you have incredible recovery, and recovery is pretty, pretty individualistic. It does vary. I've seen some guys are like recovery geniuses. Seems like my god, they can take a beat and come right back the next day. I can never do that. I, I just always felt tired and achy, and you know I'd start getting sick if I try to push the training too much. But see, the problem is even those genetic phenoms, it catches up to them. Eventually, they start to have all sorts of breakdowns. And a lot of times you don't see those guys looking so healthy once, you know, they get into their 50s and 60s. Mm-hmm. A lot of those guys quit or they're too injured or too broken up, even the genetic phenoms. I mean, look at, look at Netflix, some of these specials they've done in some of these old school bodybuilders, you know, I don't know whether you've seen any of them. But, you know, it's really pitiful what happens to these guys. Well, Ron, Ronnie Coleman, like I saw that, uh, his documentary on Netflix, and man. Or how about the one they did in West Side Barbell with Louis Simmons? You know, he was supposed to be some kind of strength guru. All his guys were completely destroyed by the time they were in their late 40s, early 50s. Some of these guys were hooked on painkillers because they're in so much agony, you know, from just, you know, just bad training. Yeah, too much, yeah, that's- too heavy too often you know the Mm -hmm. body will break down and when you're young you don't want to hear that stuff you know you think oh i'm gonna live forever and i'm okay and i've been training every day twice a day and i'm fine Mm -hmm. for now but you know in a few years you're going to feel it you're going to see it and no one escapes even olympic athletes eventually will break down you know yeah you know because the thing is high performance doesn't mean healthy you know, no, for the most part, I think high performance, usually, you know, there's a, there's a trade-off. You're, you're, you're performing at a very high elite, high level, but I mean, you're sacrificing your health for it, you know, and, your and uh, the, 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 the performance enhancing drugs do work. The problem is uh, you don't know how your body's going to react to it. And, you know, you don't know what the long-term damage is going to be. And it's pretty bad. Uh, you know, a lot of these guys are ending up with heart heart attacks and cancer and all sorts of stuff. You know, you yeah, read yeah. every paper about some guy that dropped dead. You know, should have been in his prime. You know, in the late thirties, early forties. I mean, you know, you you read about you read about it quite a bit. Well, there's, the, a, there's a very drug famous, abuse prevalent. There's a famous bodybuilder that just passed away, uh, John Meadows. I don't know if you've you've heard of him. No, but, but oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I did read a little more about that. I, I, I never followed the guy's career, but, you know. Yeah, me, well, me either, but I mean, he, you know, he's on YouTube. That's why, like, uh, I, I heard about him. Yeah. Oh, I'm getting a call here. Uh, hold on one sec. Sorry. Yeah, man. Yeah. no problem. Hey, John. Hey, I, I'm right in the middle of a podcast. Can I call you back? Okay. But, yeah, I'm going to have to go. Oh, wait, that might be him. Yeah, 
Yeah, I have a friend coming in from South Carolina. Uh, he, he's one of my black belts. And uh, I, I had a guy come from Las Vegas to get tested for black belt. You know, like in jiu-jitsu, it's very territorial. And a lot of times, you know, uh, it's really hard to get promoted if you're between schools or if you've been traveling. You know, yeah, they, they yeah, yeah. It's very, and oh, my God. Poor guys, you know, guys that travel or whatever. This guy was kind of a, a, a digital nomad like me. And uh -huh. he's been training for years. And no one will give him the time of day. So I said, you come with me, train with me for five days. I want to see what you got. I want to make sure you know all the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu self-defense. I told him to buy the master text of Jiu-Jitsu. Look online at the Gracie University and, you know, look at their combatives program, you know. And then I'm going to work with you for five days and then I'm going to test you to see, you know, where you're at. No promise. But if you do well, I'm going to promote you. And uh, John's going to come here and help me test this young guy. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. He's a, nah. he's a, yeah, he's a Chechen that uh, grew up in, uh, as a kid in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. speak, he only spoke Russian, no English. And mm -hmm. uh, he, he grew up hard, man. And uh, mm -hmm. he's a small guy to boot. But really athletic, incredibly strong. I watched him do a one arm chin up, like a, not like this fake one arm chin up. I mean, dead hang, pull, chin yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, not 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 this yeah. one. <laughs> no, no, not that. Not jumping. Not a half wrap. I'm talking dead hang, the chin over the bar with the other arm at the side. Very impressive. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, that's, that's I'm going to test. I'm going to test him on Friday, and John's coming to help me with the test. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. So do you do that for like, um, um, well, not for everybody, but for people that reach out to you and who yeah, people and reach out and say, look, I fell in between the cracks, you know, and I understand as a traveler myself, you know, it's not so easy. You know, you have to kind of go from school to school, especially when you're nomadic like that. And during the shutdown, a lot of people, you know, were not able to get to the schools, but they, they had like COVID, um, safe partner that they would train with. Mm -hmm. I did it myself. I had a couple guys. We all we all knew, you know, that we were safe, and we were trained with each other during the pandemic. I had some mats in the garage and stuff, you know, so we were able to keep up with our training even during the uh, shutdown. So, yeah. but not not everyone was so lucky, and mm -hmm. a lot of people are kind of between ranks, and they just need someone to look at them. So, but he has to do the self defense. If 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 if, if he can't show me good self-defense i don't care how good he is doing sports jujitsu okay okay but but when you say self-defense though right okay you're gonna have like uh, guys come up at him with a knife with a gun yeah and, um, is yeah. he supposed to like take care of business like uh without strikes or is he oh no no there's strikes in crazy jujitsu this you know we have slaps and uh, open hand strikes mm -hmm. uh you know we have we have uh Every kind of takedown, throw, strike, headbutts, everything's in there. Elbow. Mm, we have okay. two basic kicks that we use. It's all part of the original jujitsu curriculum. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And that's what's been lost since. Um, you know. A lot of it's been lost. The Gracie's kept it alive. Mm -hmm. the, to, to, um, to be fair, the, 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 it was kept alive in some places in Japan. Mm -hmm. There are places where they remembered the old ways, you know. But basically, what Gracie Jiu Jitsu is, it's like uh, what Maeda showed those guys, and it was preserved in a little time capsule. Yeah, you know, like yeah, yeah. Really yeah. old judo. Because basically, Gracie Jiu Jitsu is old school judo. There it's you have something. it, people. Old, old, very old school judo is essentially yeah, man. Gracie old Jiu Jitsu. That, listen, uh, that guy Maeda, I saw Maeda, that guy was a real tough customer he was a little guy but he was a formidable fighter and uh you know yeah, he was he was spending his time doing um like prize fighting essentially yeah he was against the kodokan's wishes and he he had to call himself count uh count uh count condo or something like that yeah uh, Kondu Como or something you know, <laughs> and he, he that's one reason why he never got uh, more rank okay yeah because he got caught like uh you know like doing, going again doing fight. It was considered, you know, you know, Jigger Okana wasn't too happy. Yeah, yeah, no, no, because he didn't want, like, uh, you know, because judo even was... Even the great Kimura, even he did pro wrestling fights and, you know, free free fighting. 
just to make ends meet. You know, the poor guy didn't had to feed himself, you know? So yeah. that's another reason why he didn't get the rank, but he might've been the greatest judoka, jujitsu judoka. It was almost, you know, it was almost a synonym, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a saying, uh, it's, it's the saying is, uh, no one before, no one after Kimura. That guy was amazing. Took- mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I guess you might say Hicks and Gracie is the, the greatest Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner. Mm. Uh, but I, I think I'd have to point to Kimura as the greatest jiu-jitsu slash judo guy of all time. Yeah. Yeah, that would make sense. That would make sense. Hmm. But so... Yeah, well, I've run out of time. I... Uh, I had so much fun. We, we can come back and do another round sometime if you want. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Like it would be, uh, it would be, it would be an honor to 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 do this again with you. Like I had uh, had a lot of fun. It passed by really fast. I didn't even realize that it's been a, an hour already. Yeah, no, it's like already five fourteen. Oh, and I, uh, I, I, I want to um, reemphasize that I'm not saying that certain strength training programs don't work. Mm-hmm. They do. The problem is. Everyone is always so concerned with hypertrophy and strength. They forget about sustainability and, you know, the longevity part of it. Everyone's leaving that out. And why not? When you're 20 years old, there's no light at the end of the tunnel, you know? Mm -hmm. But when you get in your mid-40s, early 50s, you start to feel your mortality. And you see the light at the end of the tunnel. And all of a sudden, you know, you start... You, you really start to feel stuff that you've been doing for like the last couple of decades. It starts to manifest. So yeah. any, any of your listeners out there that find themselves in that spot, I can help them. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And uh, in, in the intro to this, uh, to this podcast, I'm going to put like all the, um, all the information where they could, uh, they could, they yeah. could find you essentially. Yeah. It's basically uh, maxwellsc.com. Okay. Uh, S for strength, C for conditioning. Match will I see. Awesome. Awesome. Cool, man. Hey, right, thank see. you so much. Yeah, thank you. It was Hopefully, an honor. I'll see you again, man. Yes, sir. Okay. Bye now. Bye.